Hi there, welcome to 90% Knitting. This is episode 337. I'm Lisa, also known as Fiber Nymph on most of social media, and today is Sunday, May 3rd. Happy May! Uh, it is so pretty outside right now. It was like crappy and raining earlier. It's been a really weird weather weekend, but the trees are all starting to get green. Like I can look out and see like all the new leaves on the trees. I love that because you look out one day and it still looks bare. And then suddenly you look out the next day and there's poof, all the green has sprouted on the trees. It's amazing. It's like magic. Um, that happens every year. So yeah. I hope you're having some lovely springtime weather wherever you are at, and I hope you're getting able to get out and enjoy it a little bit, even if you are, you know, taking your precautions, hopefully, and staying safe with your masks or what have you. Um, anyway, this is sort of later in the day on Sunday. I've been doing other tasks today that I didn't get out here until now. Um, I'm also wearing my spinning apron. This is not my bra. Well, this is my bra. <laughs> this is a tank top. So I'm not just sitting here in an apron and my underwear, just so you know. Um, I was spinning earlier today, so I will talk about that a little bit later. Um, but yeah, I, I've just had my apron on all day and I just kind of left it on and I figured, eh, whatever. I'm not getting super dressed up today because I'm comfortable and it's actually a little stuffy in here right now. Because it's warm. I think I'm going to have to get the screens out and put them in the windows sometime this week. Because the only window that we have a screen in is our front door window, which is integral to the whole screen door. So I can just open it. It doesn't come out. But all my other windows, I took the screens out in the fall. So I have to put them back in so we can open the windows and get fresh air because I love fresh air. It makes me feel so much better. Smells good. You know what I mean? Okay. Anyway, and it's being late in a Sunday afternoon. I'm having an adult beverage. This is a really bastardized old fashioned. <laughs> I don't mix drinks the way you're supposed to. Um, I found maple old fashions. I discovered those last fall at a couple of restaurants and I fell in love with them. And I still love them, even though it may not be maple season. Well, it's sort of mapling season, actually. It's after mapling season. I, don't they maple like in March or something? Do maple syrup? Somewhere February, March, whatever. Anyway, neither here nor there. Um, yeah, so I guess when you make it regular old fashioned, you're supposed to put your sugar cube and your bitters into the glass and you muddle it around. And then I think you add maybe an orange slice. I do not like these with orange slices though. That's not my thing. Don't like that flavor. Um, and then a cherry and you do maybe do more muddling. I don't know. Then I think you add your bourbon and then you add something on top of it, like a a, they call it a floater. I don't know. <laughs> I add water to mine because I think I add probably more bourbon than you're supposed to. I don't use a shot glass to measure. <laughs> so yeah, and I just, I put everything in the glass, including the ice, squish it all around. <laughs> and then I add my water at the end after everything's all mushed together. So whatever. It tastes really good. And it's in one of my Knit Bob Pearl glasses which I know is not meant for this kind of beverage. But again, I don't follow the rules. It says lay flat to dry <laughs> and it's just super cute. I carry her note cards and gift tags in my shop. I don't carry the glassware. I just bought a couple of these for my own personal use from her. But if you're looking for really cute sheepy and knitting and spinning oriented gift cards and tags, I got you covered. They're in the shop. Check it out. Okay, so hope you're doing well. I hope you've had a good couple of weeks. Um, yeah, whatever you're doing, whatever level of stay at homeness you're at, I hope it's going well for you and I hope you're finding things to keep you occupied and busy. Honestly, I know there's like a lot of people on the news saying, oh, I'm so bored, I want to get out. But like nobody I know in person is saying that. Granted, I know a lot of knitters and spinners and fiber artists who are like, we're never bored. Like, <laughs> that's just the thing of it. I mean, I do get like being tired of not being able to just go out without really thinking about it. That I can kind of get, but I am not bored. And I doubt many of you are very bored either. 
You've always got something to do, don't you? Even if it is stuff around the house. Oh my gosh. I have to tell you about the project that we started last weekend. It's not finished yet. I'm hoping to finish it later today. I don't know if we will or not. But it had to do with furniture rearranging. I'll fill you in 10%. I'll talk about that. But in the meantime, let's talk about some knitting. Okay, that's why we're here. Um, oh, did I, I, I started this once before, so now I don't remember what I talked about and what I didn't. I know this will go up after the fact, but I just want to say, virtual Maryland Sheep and Wool. This should be Maryland Sheep and Wool weekend, and I would have been there at least yesterday, but it didn't happen, obviously. Have you guys, did you guys do any shopping with any of the Maryland Sheep and Wool vendors? They were doing the virtual show, which was amazing. I've been so enjoying watching all the videos that different vendors have put up on Facebook. Um, that's mainly where I'm focusing on it from. I guess the Maryland Sheep and Wool website itself like crashed big time because of all the traffic. <laughs> I feel bad for them because I know that was a lot of work to do that. But anyway, um, yeah, I did actually, I, I purchased some stuff yesterday from a couple of vendors and I have some more shopping I'm going to probably do today, including from Birdie Parker because she was supposed to be vending at Maryland Sheep and Wool for the first time. Um, this year and I love her stuff. I've talked about her before. Christy, she does this great knitting and crocheting jewelry. These little earrings, I love them. Um, I've got like five things in my cart in her shop right now and I have to weed through it because I can't buy five of her things even though I really want them because her stuff is amazing. Anyway, I'll talk about more about the things that I bought from Virtual Maryland um, when they come in the mail. So I'm not going to talk about it much now, but I hope you got a chance to check it out. Honestly, I feel like I feel like I got to see more vendors that I maybe wouldn't have spent a lot of time or even gone into their booths through this virtual Maryland because of the videos and the and the social media posts and stuff that um, yeah, that intrigued me and drew me in more than just like walking past the booth and especially if there's a whole ton of people or something, you know, you kind of peek in a booth and it's like, I don't have time. I'm not going through that crowd, you know, but you can get online and see their shop. I know it's not the same as being there. We all love to be there, um, but it was definitely a good second. So, By the way, today I did put concealer on, although it's a little warm, so I'm kind of looking sweaty. I did not, however, put my contacts in. So if I squint a lot today as I'm trying to look at my show notes over there, because they're just out of range. The phone, my phone, the camera is within my range without contacts, but my computer isn't so much. Lots of fun. But if I had my contacts in, then I'd have to be putting my little cheaters on and off, so... You're just getting me kind of a hot mess today, but whatever. <laughs> All right, I've got a whole bunch of fibery stuff to talk to you about, and I'm gonna start actually with crochet. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. I just knocked something over and it bounced. So hang on, I'm gonna lean out of the screen for a minute. Okay, got it. So, you know I've been on a crochet thing, right? It seems like everybody has. What is that with crochet suddenly being like the thing everybody's into? Um, I I did not work anymore on that shawl, that land lost in time shawl. I haven't worked anymore on that just because I that's something I really have to focus on because I have to pay attention to the directions, um, and I haven't had time or brain space to do that this week, but. I have been crocheting these really cute little half granny square or granny triangle kerchiefs. See there's a button on this one corner that makes it a kerchief. Um, Amy Beth from the Fat Squirrel had one on on one of her podcasts recently and I'm like oh my gosh that's so cute I have got to make one of those. So I immediately did and it actually works super well when my hair is pulled up the way it is right now. Isn't it cute? <laughs> I just think it's the most fun thing to do. Because once I get into the pattern, I still have to pay attention to the directions to get it started. Because I tried to start one last night while Bill and I were watching a movie. And I didn't have the directions out. And I could not get it started for anything. I don't know. It's not difficult. But anyway, once I get started, like it's so potato chippy to just keep going. 
So this one was made out of a whole bunch of different scraps that I have in my traveler base. So this is sport weight. I used a D hook. Um, yeah, and I did, I think, 21 rows um, on this one. And it was actually a little smaller than, once I got it finished, I thought, well, I could have probably made it a little bit bigger. But I didn't want it too big. And then I put the little button on the corner. Isn't that a fun button? It was just a one-off button I had on hand. So put that on. Um, when I don't have my hair pulled up, I can't really wear it under my hair because my hair is, even though it's a little longer than it usually has been, it's fluffy. My hair is, you know, curly and fluffy. And so it just sticks out from underneath it. So I actually have to wear it sort of on, on top. Um, of my hair rather than underneath so I wear it down a little bit further um, yeah whatever you don't care <laughs> so anyway this was the first one I made and then I made a second one because I had these scraps from the Stonehenge fiber mill yarn that I used for my um, night shift cowl by Andrea Mallory so these I used three different colorways in that and these are two of them the third one did not go in this color scheme at all. It worked fine for that cowl, but not for this. So I did this. And this one actually, I was going to make it bigger, but ended up being smaller because I ran out of these two colors. So, and even this last, last row of this one is not the full double crochet row. I'm actually not sure what stitch this is. I sort of just did my own thing. It might be a, it's not a single crochet. Is there such a thing as a half single crochet? It might be that. <laughs> I honestly don't know what it is, but it worked, so I used it. However, even doing that, I had to rip back a couple of times because I had been doing other stitches, and um, I had to keep ripping back because I was running short, and in the end, I still ran short of yarn. So this last section right here even though it's still orange and yellow, you can tell the difference, right? This is just some orange and yellow traveler that I had in my scraps. So I held it together and finished it off. So the Stonehenge Fiber Mill yarn is, I'm pretty sure it's a sport weight yarn, the crazy skeins. Um, so obviously this is a little heavier. You can even see that because when you're holding two sport weights together, it's obviously not gonna be a sport weight. But honestly, it was for like, what, three inches, it worked fine. And it's at the back of my head. So this one, I put this little toggle button on. I had this little wooden toggle, and that works really great. I The thing I, well, one of the things I love about crochet is how quickly it goes, but another thing I love is it makes its own buttonholes, you know? That's pretty awesome, so. Let me show you this one because I really love these colors. Yeah, this one's definitely tighter. Okay, so I was talking before, like, if I'm wearing these with my hair down, I kind of have to wear it like this, which looks funny with my hair up. <laughs> but, like, when my hair's not pulled all back, I can wear it that way. And you can see all the rest of my hair fluffing out. So, anyway, it's just cute. They're fun. I'm really, really trying to not make any more of them because I don't need like multiples of these, especially because they're out of wool at this point. I'm gonna, I think I'm going to try making some out of like linen or hemp or something because I've got some plant-based yarn. So maybe I'll try making one that way that I could wear, you know, just in the summer or whatever. Um, but actually the pattern that those are based off of is called the half Half a Granny Square Shawl by Church Mouse Yarns and Tees. I had to read that. Church Mouse Yarn and Tees. It's a free pattern on Ravelry. And I did, I just followed the directions and just made it smaller. You know, it's not a shawl. I really would like to make a shawl though. <laughs> now that I'm doing this, it's like, oh, that would be so much fun to make a triangular shawl that way. So who knows? Maybe I will. And maybe I'll make it out of scrap yarn. I could make it out of scrap fingering weight yarn because I've got tons. I don't think I have enough scrap sport weight left. I don't even think I have enough scrap DK. And I don't know that I would want it to be out of DK. That would be really chunky. But scrap fingering weight could be a lot of fun. It would be like my gr granny stripe blanket, really. Oh my gosh. I have so many crochet projects um, queued in my Ravelry queue that I want to make. 
I'm definitely in a crochet thing. And the thing is, I keep learning new stitches. And the more new stitches I learn, the more it's like, oh my gosh, I can just like do anything with crochet. You know, it's, it's fun. It's just, you know, something different and I'm enjoying that. So anyway, crochet. Um, another finished object that I have for you is the weaving that I showed you on the loom last time. So it's my happy warp. I finished it. Um, it's not, it has not been soaked yet. So all of my little ends are still on the back there from where I changed the colors, but it is so happy and just bright and fun. I ended up having an issue at the very end of the warp. Um, I ended up with a broken warp thread. I'm not sure why. It actually looked like it wasn't even tied on right or something. I don't know. And it was a single thread. It wasn't even like both. I don't know. I don't know what I did. Anyway, um, so I ended up sort of aborting things early um, because of that. However, I also ended it because I was at the end of my color progression. And... I guess I just didn't want to start over because my color progression starts with the purple and goes into the green to this blue. It's 12 colors. And so I had ended with the blue and that was right around the time. It was like the last couple of passes with the blue that I ended up with the problem in the warp. And I thought, you know what, I'm just going to stop. I maybe could have gotten another three or four inches out of the warp had I not stopped there but I didn't want to fuss with it. It was just not worth the effort to me. So anyway, what that means is this ended up being a bit shorter than I had intended it to be because I wanted to turn this into one of my cowls, my fringy cowls that I've been making, but I don't think this is going to be long enough because if I put this on like this, like if I try to double it, it's going to be like really close. So I don't, I don't think it's going to be long enough for that. Um, I'm thinking about playing with something with buttons though. I might be able to do something interesting with buttons that would make it, you know, button up here. I don't know. Or it could just be a scarf. That would be great too. It's drapey. It's fun. I love the colors so much. So anyway, I'm, I'm happy with it. I have not warped my loom again. Nothing else is on there. I feel like the next thing I'm going to warp it for is um, the last piece of weaving that I'm going to do with that are sitting over there, my, my hand spun minis. Um, Cause I just want to finish that project. So that'll probably be next on my loom. But in the meantime, I've still got a giant basket of DK and worsted weight minis. And that's what these all were. These were all DK except for one or two, I think were worsted weight, all my fiber nymph dye works um, yarn. So I, I, I see more of these in my future. I don't know what I'm going to do with them all. Hey, you know, eventually I may start selling them in the shop. You know, I might make the cows, the fringy cows, and just sell them in the shop. I don't know if anybody would be interested in them, but I could do that. We'll see. No promises, but I want to keep making them because I enjoy them so much. So anyway, that was my weaving. Um, What else? Oh, my other finished object this week is a hat. And I mentioned this last week. I think I showed it to you. It's my just a plain vanilla hat. Um, I'm not going to put this on because that will totally screw up my hair, <laughs> such as it is. Um, it is, the yarn is Stranded Dye Works. This was her um, BFLDK in her Tits Out Collective colorway bras off the clock. And... It's just a hat. I <laughs> uh, knit the ribbing on US 3s. I went up to US 4s for the body of the hat. I knit the ribbing super long. That's probably like seven or eight inches of ribbing. Um, I did two by two rib and I cast on 88 stitches and then I increased up to 100 stitches for the top part. So it does have a little bit of slouch in it. But I didn't make it super tall, so it's it's roomy, but it's not gonna be like like hang down slouchy. I will say on threes, this ribbing at 88 stitches is a little more snug than I typically go for. But the other hat that I made like this, I ended up making it too large. 
and it doesn't stay on and it stretches out really easily. So I don't know. Between the fact that this is BFL and probably has a little better staying power, even though it's a super wash, um, than, than the Merino one that I made, um, I, I don't know. I think basically it's going to be fine. I mean, it will stretch out a little bit as I'm wearing it. Um, and it's going to be a perfect hat for taking with me camping to sleep in when it's chilly. That's mainly what I use that hat for. So I'm happy with it. It'll get used. I love the colors and it makes a great sock puppet. <laughs> or not. I don't know. But anyway, it's a hat. It's finished. What more do you want? Okay. What else? Those are all the finished objects, right? Yeah. I have worked on a couple of things. Let me get my basket up here. I'll, I'm going to show you these out of order just because it doesn't matter. I cast on a new pair of socks. Um, my husband's birthday was this past week, and so I, among other, I mean, this wasn't his only birthday gift, but um, I pulled out six different sock yarns and I said here you get to pick what do you want your next pair of socks to be and he chose this Patton's Croy FX um, this is the chambray colors the color number on here is 2015 this is not the oh you know what maybe it's not five seven one three four okay that is the number that comes up I don't know what this other number is I was looking at the wrong number Maybe it was made in November of 2015. That could be. I don't know. Whatever. So the, the color number is 57134. It's called Chambray Colors. Which, you know, makes sense. The blues and the grays. So he liked this because he says, oh, well, this will go with a lot of things. And it will. I mean, it's very typical man colors. But anyway, I cast it on. And here we are. The whole sock is knit, the first sock. I have not Kitchenered because I want him to try it on because this yarn is definitely a heavier weight yarn than I've knit any of his other socks out of. So I just want to make sure this is going to fit him okay. And I just haven't had a chance to have him try it on at a good time when he doesn't have other socks on or shoes or something. So anyway, it's a very dense fabric and he likes that like he's felt it felt it a few times he's like yeah I really like that it's nice and warm he loves warm socks so um, I knit this on US one and a half 1.5s um, on 60 stitches and it's a two by one rib which is he loves a ribbed cuff on his sock so I did you know the cuff and the instep is so all the two by one rib slip stitch heel flap gusset, gusset decreases, <laughs> and then, you know, the sole is just stuck in that, but it is a really pretty, you know, fading, gradient-y kind of color. So, the first sock is done. This knits up so fast. His birthday was just Tuesday, and I finished this, I think, Friday, so I have not cast the other one on yet. This will be the other one. I was just, I was actually a little worried that I wasn't going to end up with enough yarn. And he likes a long cuff on his sock. I don't know how long this is. I think it's maybe, it's at least seven and a half inches. That's what it was the last time I measured it. So that might be how long this is. But I was afraid to go anymore. And this is the only, this is all the yarn I have left from that first sock. So I probably gauged that pretty well. I maybe could have done another half an inch. But... I'd rather err on the side of caution. So anyway, first sock is done. He'll get the second, well, I'll do the second one soon. This has been my sitting at the table knitting at breakfast and after dinner project because it's easy and I don't have to think about it. So socks. Um, yeah, the other thing I have been working on and it's not finished, I thought it might be, but it's not, is my lineage pullover. I did finish the body. Was the body finished? No, the body, I don't think the body was finished when I wore it last episode. Um, I did finish the body. However, I screwed up and I forgot to change my needles to the smaller size to do the ribbing. And I didn't think about it until I was like halfway through. Now granted, this ribbing is only like an inch long, so it's not a big deal. I will have to rip it back because I thought it would be okay. And when I have it on, 
Like I kind of like the way it hangs with the ribbing in the same side, but it wants to flip up. So I do have to rip that back and go down a needle size to do that ribbing. Um, the neck band ribbing was on US 2s. The body was on US 4s. I'm probably going to go down to US 3s for this. I don't know. I could do the 2s, but I think 3s will be enough of a difference to keep it from flipping up. Meanwhile, I didn't do that first. I decided to work on sleeves. So I took all the rest of the yarn. So I'm working with six balls of yarn. This is my Fiber Nymph Dye Works Mountain Tweed DK, one of the Serendipity sweater sets. And so the yarn that was all left over, I took it and I weighed it all and I split it into two even balls, each of the six colors, so that I would know that I had the same amount of yarn for both of the sleeves. I'm not knitting them concurrently, but I am keeping track of exactly what I'm doing. I'm making notes so that I can do the exact same thing on the second sleeve. Now I'm not doing the striping pattern the exact same way that I did on the body. One reason is because when I finished the body, I had cycled through the colors and was on like the third time through with all of the colors. And so the first two colors had been used more than the other four colors. So I didn't have as much of that yarn. However, that was also where the sleeves were picking up with the first couple of colors. So I couldn't do as many repeats as I had done in the body. And actually that's fine because, let's see if I can hold this in a way for you to see this. So this, yeah, this goldish yellow color. So that means I was able to maintain that. But this next color, I had to stop earlier. And then I started the serendipity skein earlier than it starts in the body, which I'm glad about, because then it sort of ends halfway through there. What I'm trying to avoid is having all of the stripes go the whole way across, like from arm to body to arm. I don't want that visual line going horizontally like that. So the fact that these are getting staggered, um, and again, like I just, when I was finished with colors three and four, I did do five and six, but then I had to start over with three because I don't have any more of one and two left for this sleeve. So even the way the colors are, are flowing together is going to be different um, on the sleeves than it is in the body. But here I am again, I'm starting the serendipity stripe striping here again, and it's actually at the end of this serendipity stripe in the body, which is the, that was the first one. So there's two serendipity stripes in the body um, and the sleeve one will be kind of above and below it. Anyway, makes sense to me. I like it. I've, I keep trying it on because I'm not sure how long I'm going to be able to make the sleeves and I just want to see where they're at. Right now, the last time I tried them on, I think they were sort of like right about here. So below my elbow, but not down to my wrist yet. I think I'll probably have enough yarn to do full length sleeves. I'm looking at the balls that are left in the basket. Um, if not full length, they should be pretty close. You know, they might end up being like bracelet, bracelet length sleeves, if I understand what that means. Because isn't bracelet length kind of like right above your wrist, sort of right here? They might end up being right there. I don't know. but. I'm happy with it. I'm still loving it. I can't wait for it to be done. Um, not that I'm going to be wearing it, obviously, because it's too warm, but I just, I can't wait to see the finished product, product and soak it. And yeah, I think it's going to be a cool sweater. That takes us to spinning, which actually takes us to fleece washing. So if you guys have been watching the podcast for any length of time, you know that I have this habit of buying fleeces when I go to fiber shows, fiber festivals, and then I bring them home and then I don't do anything with them because I'm too intimidated by the process of scouring them to do anything, <laughs> which is ridiculous. I've got a lot of, um, okay, I have, I think I have at least five full fleeces and then I've got other fleece that I was able to buy just like by the pound or half pound or what have you um, that I've just never really done much with. So for whatever reason this past week, uh, I think it was Thursday, I was having a very, very productive 
no, it was Wednesday, actually, because I kept thinking all day, wow, I'm having such a productive Monday. And then it's like, but it's Wednesday. <laughs> Whatever. We take productivity on whatever day of the calendar it falls on. So anyway, I had a really, really good dye day that day. And I was downstairs. And by the time I was done dyeing, I still had energy. And I'm like, what can I do? And I'm like, I'm going to wash fiber. Or, you know, I'm going to wash some fleece. So I have some partial fleeces that I purchased at Maryland Sheep and Wool from the Spinning Loft back in 2018. I bought three different breeds um, and I bought a pound of two of them and then a half a pound of the other one. So I went in the bin that I had those stored in and I pulled the one out and it was the Tessel. It's pronounced Tessel, T-E-X-E-L, but from the online pronunciation guide I found for it, it's Tessel is how it's pronounced. Tessel is the name of an island off the coast of the Netherlands and that's where these sheep originate, I believe. Um, they are, okay, I'm going to read you notes. Actually, no, I'm not, I'm not going to get that out. I did bring the fleece and fiber source book out. Okay, I'll show it to you. You probably already know what it looks like though. It's a big ass book. <laughs> okay. Fleece and fiber source book by Deborah Robeson and Carol Acarius. So, big honking book. Beautiful book, though. Anyway, according to the Fleece and Fiber source book, Tessel were named after the island of Tessel, off the coast of the Netherlands, where the native sheep were crossed with Lincoln and Leicester Longwools in the mid-1800s to develop the modern Tessel. The goal was to create a high quality meat breed. So it is predominantly a meat breed and it's fiber production tends to be secondary, um, even to this day. They were brought into the United States in 1985. Um, and yeah, the, the wool is definitely considered a secondary crop according to this book. Um, it's, I can tell you what I've learned about it from playing with it. Um, here's what it looks like now. This was a little sample that I spun up. Here's what, if I have a picture, I think I took a picture. I think I took a picture of some of the washed fleece next to some of the unwashed fleece. Huge difference. Um, here's what it looks like. This is one half of it. <laughs> half a pound flips up like this because it was, the whole pound was stuffed into a bag smaller than this when I bought it. Um, yeah, it's pretty. The yellow in it, and I, you know what, I, I recorded a short little video clip earlier today about how I'm spinning this. And I will pop that in here shortly. Some of what I'm saying now might be repetitive for what I said in that. I can't remember what I said in that. But I think I referred to this yellowing color that's on some of the fleece. Here, let me see. Let me pull out a, a fluff. <laughs> um... So you see how it's got some yellowing. That's called yoking. I'd never heard the term before, um, but it was on the Spinning Lofts website when I went to look there. Apparently, the best I can understand it, and I'm going to read this because I did copy it out of a, <clears throat> a website. It's from an article that was in Hobby Farms by Stephanie Wilkes. Um, and she said, according to the American Sheep Industry Sheep Handbook, it says, the normal yolk color is due to a golden lanarin, L-A-N-A-U-R-I-N pigment produced by swint glands. I don't know what a lot of these word mean, words mean. Swint glands that are associated with the primary wool follicles. So I'm assuming they're kind of like sweat glands maybe that produce the lanolin which obviously sweat glands don't produce lanolin but swint glands maybe do because other things I I wasn't able to find out a lot of information about this yoking um, but what I was able to read in a couple of different places did refer to it as being coloring from the lanolin or lanolin like substance I don't know um, yeah so 
it's not harmful to the fiber. It doesn't affect how it spins. It doesn't affect, like it doesn't damage the fiber in any way. A lot of it did wash out when I washed the fiber, um, but there is that residual just golden look to it. And I think it's so pretty. Um, it's, it, I don't know if it will affect it if I try to over dye this yarn when it's finished. Um, yeah. Anyway, I will pop that little video in here. Hello, it's Lisa from the past. Um, I'm sure I probably already gave you an intro to this little clip here, but I'll just summarize it again anyway. I had bought a few uh, partial pieces, like uh, the spinning loft <laughs> at Maryland Cheap and Wool in 2018. I bought three um, like partial fleeces. They sell fleece in the four ounce incre in four, four ounce increments at the spinning loft. And so I pulled one of those out and it was the Texel fleece and I decided I was going to wash that. And so I did. And if I, ha I think I took a picture of what it looked like, some of it prior to washing and then some of it after it was washed. If I have that picture, I'll put it in here. This is what it looks like now that it is washed. It does have yellow towards the tips, like here's one of the locks. So you can see there's some yellow. I think that's called yoking. I don't know what that means. I don't know if it's just like a stain from lanolin or if it's something altogether different. I, I need to look that up. And maybe by the time I actually record the at real podcast, I will have done that. Maybe not, no promises. But anyway, it does not affect the yarn. Actually, the yarn looks really pretty. I don't have it in here, my little sample that I did the other day, but it gives it a really pretty golden color. I don't know. Maybe you can see, like, that's how it's spinning up now. I just started spinning some more. It's just a really pretty creamy golden color. So I'm pretty excited about it. Um, this was not a lan overly lanolin-y fleece. So I, again, I didn't I didn't look up a lot about Texel either. I need to read about that too. I was just in the mode and I wanted to dive in and just do it, which is how I do a lot of things. So anyway, it didn't have a lot of lanolin, which was nice. So it didn't take a lot to get it cleaned. Um, maybe at some point I'll talk a little bit more about the process I'm using to clean my fleeces. Again, first time I've done this, so I'm in no way a position to say, oh, I'm an expert at this because I'm not. But anyway, it worked really well. I put it through, this batch I put through just a, a rinse. I did this half and half, like a half pound and then a half pound because I have to work in small batches for where I have to work and I can't dump this water down our, into our septic system. I don't want to anyway because I don't know what all that lanolin even though this didn't have a lot, might do to our septic system. So I'm working in these this big um, plastic bin with smaller bins with holes for the fiber in it. Um, and I have to roll it outside. I have a big cart that I can use to roll it outside to dump it whenever I'm done. So I have to work in manageable sized batches. Anyway, so this took two days. I did half the batch one day, half of it the other day. So this is a half a pound of fiber. It's actually a little less because you lose some in the washing process because you, you know, you lose dirt, you lose some veg matter. You can see though, there's still a good bit of veg matter in this fiber. That does not necessarily come out in the washing. That comes out more in the prepping to spin. Um, so like if you're combing it or carding it, or if you have a picker, um, that's what's used to, I think, get rid of a lot of that veg matter. However, I do not have a picker. I do not have a drum carder. I do have hand cards. I do have hand combs. I have a hackle. So I have a lot of things that I could use to hand process this fiber. But what I found really quickly, just playing with it after it was dried, was like, I could also just take the locks and just sort of open them up with my fingers. And in doing this, a lot of that remaining veg matter drops out. So that's what I'm sitting here by my spinning wheel. I have my spinning apron on that I tend to wear. Um, and my lap is right now full of little bits of veg matter. So when I'm done, I kind of scoop my apron up so I can go outside and shake it off. 
Um, but anyway, just in the process of doing this, this is coming apart really well. So I think for the foreseeable future, I'm not going to bother to comb this or card this or anything because again, I did not really look up to see what the best processing would be for this particular fiber. But this is working out really well and when I sampled it, it worked out really well as a two ply this way. Um, so yeah, I'm just fluffing it out as much as I can and then I'm kind of taking it and like pre-drafting it and then as I pre-draft it, I don't know that you'll be able to see the bits falling out of it, but I can see them. Like they, they kind of get loosened up because you're pulling the fibers apart and the fibers are what's holding that bit of grass and hay and things in there. And as I come to them, sometimes I kind of help them along to drop out. Um, but I just, I do this pre-drafting and then there are still a few little bits, you know, stuck in there. I'm just gonna do that much for right now. I mean, there's still, you know, some little tiny bits stuck in there, but they seem to come out as I draft it to spin it. And so at the last, the last resort is as it's spinning, I sometimes stop the wheel and if I have to, I'll pick a little piece out. I really don't have a problem leaving a tiny bit of veg matter into the final yarn. That doesn't bother me. I kind of like that rusticky bit. I mean, sometimes you buy commercial yarns that are, you know, more rustic and they have that and that that's not a bothersome thing to me. So I'm not super worried about it, but I thought I would at least show you how I'm spinning it since I have it here. And sometimes people ask that this isn't like an official spinning video, but it'll just give you an idea of, you know, what I'm doing with this once I've done that little bit of prep. And that's really all I'm doing to prep this. So this is my Ashford Traveler wheel. <laughs> such as you can see it. It's my favorite wheel. I have this and I have a sidekick, a shaft sidekick, but I love this wheel. This was my first wheel I bought. It was used. I got it for super good price off of Craigslist. Um, yeah, and I love this wheel. It can be a little noisy and I can't remember if this bobbin that's on here is one of the noisy bobbins or not. So I, I apologize in advance if there's some noise, but anyway, I'm um, just going to pick up with what's already on there. And I'm basically spinning this woolen, which means I'm pinching, I'm letting this twist build up and then I'm pulling and then I'm letting the twist enter into the rest of that fiber. So I'm pinching it here and here and I'm letting go and then the twist enters in. Um, that's basically spinning woolen. It's a lighter, airier kind of spin. It leaves more air between the fibers. They're a little more puffed up. I have to remember to treadle slowly doing this fiber <laughs> to do the woolen spinning because this is not my default spin. My default spin is a worsted spin where I'm treadling to beat the band. <laughs> and um, yeah, if you're, if you're spinning worsted, you're smoothing the yarn down and kind of squishing the air out of the fiber. And that's not what I want to do with this. I want to let this be a, a light, airy fiber. And like I said, I don't have my sample from the other day in here, or I would show it to you, but I'm sure I'll probably show it to you on the actual podcast video, either before or after this clip. So yeah, as I'm doing this, like I know you can't see it, but I am watching some of those remaining little bits of veg matter drop out of the fiber. I haven't had to pick any of them out. Um, but yeah, so that's how far, that's how I'm doing this. And um, you know, it's turning out really well. I really, let's see if I can zoom in a little. Yeah, yeah I mean, you can see a little bit in there, but again, it's nothing major. I just think it's so pretty and I'm really happy with how <laughs> this first um, fiber washing experiment has turned out. So anyway, I just wanted to share that with you. Back to the regular video now. So hopefully everything that I said in there wasn't a complete repeat of what I tried to tell you, but I at least did show you how I'm spinning it and how I'm getting the veg matter out. There was definitely a lot of veg matter, which the book does say that's not uncommon with this breed since it is not bred for its fleece. They're very rarely jacketed fleece. Um, and so there's often a lot of veg matter, but it does come out super easily. I'm very pleased about that. So anyway, this was just a little sample that I spun up. This is a two ply and that's probably how I'm going to do it. 
I did have a tiny bit left on the one bobbin and I tried to chain ply it. That did not go well. It's just a little bit too grippy of a fiber for that to have worked super well for me. So I'm going to stick with the two ply plus I can get more yardage since I only have a pound of it. I actually ended up with like 15 ounces of it after it was washed. Um, so anyway, it's just been a fun little project. I don't know how quickly I'll get through it, especially since I'm doing all the prep just by hand, literally by hand, not using any tools. I mean, I might play with cards or something like my cards or it, the, um, the source book does say that no matter how you prep it, like you can pretty much do whatever you want with this fiber, but however you prep it, it's going to be very squishy, very airy, very lofty, um, because that's just the nature of this fiber. And whether you spin it woolen or worsted, it's still going to have that loft to it. You're not going to be able to get rid of that. Um, and that's fine. I, I really like that. So I'm planning to spin it woolen because it's working out really well that way. So anyway, it's fun and yeah, it does not smell like sheep at this point. It, it smells a little bit like the scour that I use, the power scour. Um, <laughs> yeah, but not, not excessively. It smells good. And it's, it is, it's super squishy. Oh my gosh. Okay. I will stop squishing my yarn now. <laughs> Okay, so the only other crafting I've done since I talked to you last is I did a little bit more sewing. I made some more masks. Um, I actually have a whole bunch that are cut out and pinned and all the sewing is done except for the pieces that the, the ties will go through. But I, I did that last weekend and then we started this other big project in the house and I didn't get to finish them. So that's next on my agenda is to finish those because those are for some friends and also a couple more for Bill and I. But meanwhile, I did try, those are all the ones, the pleated masks, but I did end up making one of the more fitted masks using the craft passion pattern that I'll link in the show notes. I made this one for Bill because I had this fabric and I wanted to make a mask out of this fabric and it was just too big of a design to fit onto the pleated mask. You kind of lose the birds in it, but you know. It works great for this. So I made Bill a parrot mask and look at this. I mean, I have no idea what I bought this fabric for originally. It's been in my stash forever. And I bought these two, I know I bought both fabrics together to make something. That's frightening, right? Anyway, it worked out fine. It actually wasn't as fidgety as I thought it was gonna be. I did put the, the nose, wire in here. So there's that. Um, I didn't end up following the directions for assembly that were in the craft passion website, mainly because they went on for a while and I got confused. So I just kind of winged it and it worked out fine. The pattern that I cut out, cause she's got multiple patterns up. I cut out the men's, the men's size for having the nose wire in it, but it wasn't the one that was supposed to have the lining where you could stick another filter in there, but I ended up making it that way because the only difference I could tell was that you, you turned this over and made a hem there rather than hemming it together with the face fabric. I don't know. It is so warm in here. I'm so sorry. I feel like I'm glowing a lot. Anyway, um, and this has tons of cat hair on it because I think a cat must have been on Bill's desk, which is where this has been sitting. Anyway, so otherwise, I mean, it was fine. I, I did not, again, I didn't follow the directions for putting it together the same as they were in the pattern, but it went together fine. I did do the tie the same way, just one big loop um, with a little cord lock on it. So... I think he, he hasn't really worn it out anywhere yet. He had it on one day last weekend. My, my son, my middle son, my middle child, my youngest son came up to the house um, to pick up some bandanas that I sewed for him. Um, and so he, Bill had this on just while he was here and we were social distancing appropriately. Um, so yeah, so I sewed that 
I think if I make any more masks at this point, they probably will be the pleated ones just because I have that pattern down. Even though this was the men's size, it's very, it's very snug on Bill. It fits me fine. So if I did make it again, I'd probably, for him, I'd have to size it up, I think, to make it less snug on his face. I don't know. We'll see. I mean, I didn't, I didn't alter anything that should affect the fit. So I'm thinking maybe it just runs, it's good for smaller faces. <laughs> That's my estimation. But anyway, in the meantime, I had asked my son if he wanted any masks because I knew they needed to wear them at work. And even though, you know, his, his company is providing the masks for them at work, um, he's not crazy about them. And so he's like, well, could you make bandanas for me? Because he would prefer to just wear a bandana. They're allowed to wear bandanas. It's just they have to have something covering their face. And I said, well, yeah, I can. I said, can't you buy them? And then realized, no, you can't. Because apparently everybody has purchased all the bandanas in the world. <laughs> so fine. So I made him, I think, like seven bandanas. I will, however, say making masks is far less fussy than making bandanas because even though you're only sewing straight seams around the four sides, you have to fold in double folded hems on all the sides and they're t and you want them tiny, right? <laughs> and I was trying to do like mitered corners for the, oh my gosh, it was such a pain in the butt. I did them because I love my son and I'm willing to do it, but they were a pain. I'm glad they're done. And I hope they, I need to ask him because he does laundry, you know, on the weekends. I'll have to ask him if they held up okay in the laundry. So anyway, but that's been my sewing. I really would like to be sewing other things, but masks have been what I've been sewing. I think I'm about done though. Once I finish that pile of ones that I have for some friends in the bedroom, I'm going to be done with mask sewing for a while, I think. Anyway, um, what else do I have for you? Those are all the crafts. I think that's plenty. I was pretty, you know, productive in my crafting. Um, 20 and 20 challenge is obviously still going on. I mentioned that last time. I do want to mention though, I've decided that I'm going to add a sub challenge to this for the next month. Okay, so if you're participating in the 20 and 20 challenge, even if you're not participating in the regular 20 and 20 challenge and you want to participate in this extra little challenge I'm tacking onto it for the next month, feel free. You don't have to be doing the main 20 and 20 challenge. But I'm going to tack on a sub challenge for using leftovers because I've been on such a leftovers kick lately between the crochet things and my weaving and everything like that. I know you guys probably have a lot of leftovers too. And if you don't, that's fine. You don't have to participate, you know? Um, but like, I just want to do a little challenge for scraps. What can you make out of your scraps? You know, if you want to, like if you don't want to make anything, don't. But like, if you do want to, let's see, what can we make out of scraps? So I'm going to put up a, a thread in the group, the Fiber Nymph Dye Works group, specifically for you to post finished objects that you have made using scraps, just scraps. It doesn't, it can be any scraps. Like it doesn't just have to be fiber and dye work scraps. It can be any yarn scraps, but what have you made? You can knit, you can crochet, you can weave, whatever. If you have fiber scraps, I don't know if that's a thing. Like usually when I spin my fiber, I just spin all the fiber. But if for some reason you have fiber scraps sitting around, feel free to use that too. Every time you finish a scrap project, a leftovers project, post a picture of it in the, um, in the thread and at the end of the one month period, actually I'm gonna leave that thread open until I record the first episode in June. So I'm doing, this is the first one in May, so it'll go till I'm ready. I'll close it right before I record the first episode in June. And you know, I'll pull a winner or two depending on how many entries there are. I just thought it'd be something fun. So take part if you'd like. <laughs> And again, it can be open to anybody. If you're not doing the regular 20 and 20, you can still take part in this little extra challenge. Um, that is everything I have for 90% except new, oh, new things. So I guess that's still 90%. Duh. <laughs> um, yes. 
the two new things I have to show you are things I bought from my LYS, which ironically, I've never actually been to their physical store, but I do dye yarn for them occasionally. Um, so I, I've been trying to support them through, you know, this time where they're closed and they're still trying to keep the shop open. So I've placed a couple of orders and the first one I placed was for this yarn, Paradigm Shift, it's a Cascade yarn. I just thought it was so pretty. Now this is a cotton yarn and it's, this is the Circus colorway, color four. I just thought it was so pretty. Um, the local yarn shop, by the way, is McWalker Yarn in Millvale, PA, which is, it's an area of Pittsburgh. Um, anyway, so yeah, this is the, the one I bought. This is 200 grams, so 371 yards. Um, of mercerized cotton. I don't have a clue what this is going to become yet, <laughs> but I just thought the colors were so pretty. I couldn't pass it up. So I bought that. And then last weekend, McWalker's was having their second anniversary and they had to do that virtually, which was fun. I did watch their, their you know, online stuff that they did their live on Facebook. Um, but they ended up, they had a, an anniversary colorway, um, that was by Knitterly Things, which is Vesper Yarns. And this is the Glitterful Sock, and this is the colorway Midnight in Millville, which, again, Millville is the town that the shop is in. So I got it on the sparkly base. It's a self-striping yarn. I don't buy a lot of hand-dyed self-striping yarns since I dye self-striping yarns, but every once in a while I do. And, um, yeah, Julia does such pretty colorways. She actually used to live in Pittsburgh. I don't I know she moved. I don't think she's come back, but um, maybe she has. I honestly don't know. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah. So, fun, sparkly, stripey yarn. No plans for it yet, but it'll be socks eventually. I can pretty much say. So those are my new things. Like I said, I've been shopping the Virtual Maryland Sheep and Wool, and I'll show you those things after they arrive. So that'll probably be the next podcast. Moving on into 10%. Okay, so let me tell you about our big project. So we have an office that's in one of our bedrooms and that has my husband's desk and my desk, which before we got married, Bill bought me a beautiful desk and hutch, like bookcase that sits on top of the desk. It's beautiful and it's been in the office and I love it, but I hate being in that office because it's an inside bedroom and again we're in a log home it's very dark and it's on the north side of our house and it just doesn't get a lot of light so I find it very hard to work in there um, even on the computer I just do because the just the lighting is just not great in there so more often than not when I'm on my computer I'm either sitting out here at the dining room table or I take it back into the yarn room I like I just I'm transient you know and I I was using the desk more to store stuff on or pile stuff on and the printer was on there and you know which it's a Wi-Fi printer so you don't even have to have the computer there but anyway finally like a few weeks ago I said to him you know I really want to be able to use my desk I love my desk it's beautiful you bought it for me I said I would use it so much more if it was in the yarn room <laughs> because there's plenty of light there. That's a really well lit room. It's in the northeast, northwest corner. So it gets a lot more light. I've recorded in there before. So anyway, I said, what if we moved my desk into that room and swapped it out with my yarn cubbies that have all my private, my, my personal stash yarn, not the business yarn, the personal stash yarn and put that in the office. And he actually agreed with me that that would be a great idea. <laughs> Sometimes I come up with these ideas and he's like, I don't know, you know. But he was in agreement that that would be an excellent idea. And he's like, I'd be happy to help you with that if you want. And so I said, great. And so we did that last Sunday. I spent Saturday because I had to take all of the yarn out of the cubbies for one thing. And then I had to take everything out of my desk before we could move it. And there was tons and tons of books in the bookcase and like all the stuff in the desk. It looked like a royal mess. I mean, you know how that goes, right? When you try to do an organizational project and yet you make way bigger of a mess than you started with. 
So that's what happened. <laughs> but anyway, we did end up swapping those out. So now my, my yarn cubbies that have all my personal stash are in the office, which is weird to me in a way. I kind of miss having them in the yarn room, but I love having my desk in the yarn room. I will say the organization has not quite finished like I still have work to do in that yarn room which I really I, I'm going to try to finish it today when I'm done recording um, just because there's things I just don't know where to go with at this point so I need to figure that out yet I have tried to um, I put all of the yarn back in the yarn cubbies that was like my first priority got to got to organize the yarn and it was really kind of funny because as I was doing that I thought you know I feel like I just did this and I did back at the beginning of the year when I was organizing my stash for my 20 and 20 stuff you know so I got to play with my yarn again that's always fun though because then you get to see what you have and you know play with it so anyway that's all done now yarn is back I would say three quarters of the other stuff is back where it needs to go or has found a home but I still need to finish that up and yeah, so that has been a huge project. And that is what derailed me from finishing those masks because the room that I was sewing in got kind of crazy. However, in the process of doing this, we also ended up doing a couple things out here in the dining room. Uh, my dining room table from my house has been, well, first it was in the basement and then we had to move it from the basement up here it's dis it was disassembled and it was leaning in our hallway. We moved it up here like in January. And so it's been an obstacle in our hallway. But Bill's been like, well, you know what? It's going to get ruined because the cats are going to get on it. The cats are going to scratch stuff and everything. And it's like, okay, we're always going to have cats. <laughs> so like, I don't care. At this point, I just wanted to be able to use my table because I really love my dining room furniture. It's the only furniture... I ever purchased on my own like after I got my divorce it's like I had to replace the dining room furniture because the furniture that had been there would have been my ex's grandmother's furniture so obviously he took that with them when he left so anyway like that furniture has meaning to me like this furniture so we decided since we had to move it out of the way anyway in order to move that other furniture through the hall we would assemble the table and put it in the dining room I was so happy <laughs> So my dining room table and chairs is now in our dining room. However, you might also know, especially if you watch the weaving videos, uh, my piano has been sitting in our dining room because it didn't have a permanent place yet. Um, but it's been sitting on these two big furniture dollies wrapped up with straps and quilts over it. And it's just been sitting there for like two years now. And I said, you know, if we're doing this, can we please just take the piano off the dollies and unwrap it and just, it can stay right where it's at. We don't have to move it. Um, and so we ended up doing that because the other thing is like at least once a month, my husband's like, I wish I had my dollies. <laughs> I need to use them. So this way he got his dollies back, he got his straps back, and now the piano's out. I have not actually sat and played it yet, but I'm so happy to have it there because it makes a huge difference in our living room and dining room area, which is one big open space. It looks so much neater and cleaner without having that strapped down piano with blankets and cardboard all around it just sitting there. I feel like the light has just changed in here and I look more orange for some reason and I don't have any idea why. I think it's the, the clouds outside did something really weird. Okay, um, we're going to move on to shop news. First off, Monthly Makes 2020, the second quarter, we're still underway. So I did the random number generator to pull a winner for the monthly makes for the April chatter thread. And um, I don't have the numbers written down how many posts there were. Sorry, I wrote it down and then I didn't put it in my show notes. But anyway, from all of the April posts in the chatter thread, random number generator chose post number 337. And that is Amanda, who is Grable. So congratulations, Amanda. 
um, you are the winner. And I actually have three yarn choices for you. I know usually I would only show two, but I have three that you can pick from. Um, one is a skein of my bunnies speckled stripe. So that's two stripes. One is a variegated stripe and the other is the speckled stripe. This was an Easter colorway that I did last year. And then I never ended up dying up Easter colorways this year for the shop because it was right around the time that everything got weird and Allentown got canceled and I just, I never got Easter colorways in the shop this year, but this was one that was left over from the show that I had done at the beginning of March. It was the only skein left over. So I never put it in the shop because it was only one. So you can choose that or you can choose one of these colorways, which are both one of a kind colorways. Um, I had a special order come in and they're both custom colorways, but she only needed one skein of each. So I have the other two. So they're both four stripe colorways. They're both on Bedazzled. This one has uh, pinks and yellows and oranges. And there's two different, like a, it's a pink and a pinkish purple. And then this one is a blue and a purple and a silver and a lighter blue. I'm gonna say, or no, it's sort of sand. That's the fourth color, like the sandy taupe color. And I'm sorry, they look really weird in this lighting right now. I wish I knew why the sky was doing this, but it is. It's like sepia tone. <laughs> I don't know. So anyway, tell me which one of these. Bounce, and both of these are on Bedazzled. Um, whichever one of these that you would like. Amanda, let me know and I'll get that prize sent out to you. And I will continue to do monthly prize draws for the chatter thread for monthly makes, even though the monthly makes program is running on a quarterly basis. <laughs> so, okay, now I need to get my show notes back. Um, I did not put any new items in the shop this week, um, just because I knew virtual Maryland Sheep and Wool was gonna be happening and I kind of just wanted to not offer competition to the Maryland vendors because they're Maryland vendors and this was supposed to be their show weekend and they're they're not getting to do it. So anyway, hopefully you guys shopped with Maryland. Um, I will be putting some things in the shop this coming week. I have my first throwback Thursday colorway will be going up this Thursday and that will be my Fruit Loops colorway. So watch for that on Thursday. And then by Friday, I'm hoping to do an update as long as everything goes well. Um, and it's going to be a die to order update of my new game, game night, gosh, words, of my new game night collection. Um, so it's sort of like the next installation of game night. So my game night colorways that I've done in the past, I did Advanced to Go, which was a Monopoly inspired colorway. I did Face Card, which was a just cards, you know, playing cards colorway. I did Usual Sp Suspects, which was Clue. And then That's Not Even a Word, which was Scrabble. That's Not Even a Word was the most popular, I think, out of all of those. Um, and I'll pr I'm gonna try to put some of the That's Not Even a Word in the shop as well as um, usual suspects because those two were really pretty popular so I may put some pre-order spots up for those as well as the new colorways but the new colorways I don't have them to show you yet because I'm not finished dyeing them but I can tell you the games that they're going to be um, based on there will be a Trivial Pursuit inspired colorway a chess colorway a life game of life colorway battleship apples to apples and then I have one that is inspired by puzzles because I know a lot of people are doing puzzles right now my mom and her husband have been doing so many puzzles so those are six new game night colorways um, that will be coming this week and again I'm doing them as die to order and I think I might be offering new colors as die to order for the foreseeable future mostly because of space issues um, I have a ton of yarn sitting in the yarn room, business yarn, that was meant to be show yarn. And a lot of it has sold through my updates and everything, and when we did like virtual Allentown, but I've still got a lot, and it's not going to be going to shows anytime soon. So I just, I don't have, I physically do not have the space to have more inventory sitting around. But since I've got the time that I can do die to order 
um, orders, <laughs> fairly quick turnaround. Um, I'm going to say two to three weeks maximum. So that's half as much time as my special orders usually can take. Um, I'm going to be doing things dyed or that way I can offer more of them. I can offer more of the yarn bases that I know you guys are wanting because as I see things sell out, I can add more, more easily, if that makes sense. Um, rather than me just dying up the bases I think might sell and then, then, you know, some of them sell and the other ones just sit here and don't sell for a long time. I just, I need to use my space and my resources a little bit better right now. So. If you don't mind having a little bit of a wait um, and for your happy mail to come in, then I hope that will work for you. So again, there'll be the six, hopefully I'll have all six of them ready for Friday, fingers crossed. I will be posting pictures of them obviously before Friday on various social media. I'll try to maybe put together a little video that I can put up on the channel too. Um, I have another new colorway that I have planned. I haven't dyed it yet, but I really want to do it. <laughs> and I'm trying to decide if I should make it part of a collection or if I should just make it a one-off colorway, but I've been wanting to do it for a while. So I'm not going to say anything more about that, but I've got all these new colorway ideas and I'm dying to get them dyed up for you. Um, I also want to do another color play collection. I have the colors in my brain. I just need to dye them and I want, um, I want to do that super soon too. So look for that in May. That'll definitely be coming in May. I know I just did one. I did one in all of last year and now I did one earlier this year and there'll be another color play coming. But it'll def it'll be more springy kind of colors, springy going into summer kind of colors. So I, I think it'll be nice for this time of year. Um, other than that, I need to let you know, save the date because I've had so many people asking me if I'm going to be doing the holiday mini select collections this year. And I am, I am doing them. I was going to hold off and do the signups in summer, but since I've had so many people asking about them, I'm going to do it earlier in the summer than I plan to. So signups for the, well, not signups, but pre-orders for the holiday mini countdown collections are going to start on June 1st. So be looking for that. Obviously I will talk to you more about that as the time draws nearer, but that is when I will start the pre-orders for that. So I'll have more information on that in the next podcast. Um, what else? I think that might be everything. Um, oh, I wanted to share with you, I got a new printer for labels. I've never had a label printer, so you will notice a difference if you order from me because your labels are now going to be a, an actual label. They're not going to be a half a sheet of paper that I've had to tape on your envelope. They're actually going to be printed with my new thermal label printer. I'm so excited about this thing. It's another magic thing. Like a label prints out like zoop, suddenly there's a label there instead of taking a longer time. This is just a, a sample label they gave us to gave me to print out from the company. It's a Rolo printer. I don't remember what what model number, but yeah, it's very cool. So that will be my new labels for that. And I'm also going to be using it for ball band labels, which these are a little larger than my old ball band labels. So they're going to have to go on the label in a different way. Um, so if you see my labels covering up like the care, you know, instructions and stuff like that, don't worry, that stuff will be printed on the label from now on, um, on the sticky label, not the ball band itself. So you won't be missing any information. It'll just be on there in a different way. But anyway, I'm super excited about this printer now that I've gotten it up and running because you know what it's like when you get a new peripheral and you have to figure out how to make all the drivers talk to the programs and things. Lots of fun. <laughs> Okay, I think that's everything. I'm going to go and again, I hope you guys are doing super well um, or just even moderately well. I hope you're having enough things to keep you busy. I will be back with you in a couple of weeks. Take care.